Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me here. I think um, it's just absolutely wonderful that uh, we had Charity here to, to open the show because I don't have to say anything to you about what a wonderful miracle transplantation can be, okay? Ever since we did the first successful lung transplant in a human in Toronto in 1983, thousands of patients worldwide have, been, have returned to healthy, productive lives, and charity is a wonderful example of, of what we strive to achieve. It's not a perfect science yet, but we're getting there. And you really have to stop and think about two things that every one of you in the audience here is breathing, and I bet you most of you aren't even thinking about the fact that you breathe. And think about the people who sit there, and all they think about day in and night is, is about their breathing and how hard it is to breathe. The second thing is that Charity would not be here today. She would not be alive was it not for her lung transplant performed a year ago. So, it is a fantastic medical marvel, and I've done hundreds of lung transplants, and yet every single time I do that operation, it, I, I marvel at what we do, that we can actually do that to a human body. Take one lung out, take the other lung out, put two lungs back in, and they survive it. And she depicted the story of, of, of how, what a rough go she had of it. I mean, it's not always roses. It's not always so easy. Yes, sometimes we do a lung transplant today and the patients go home in about 10 days or something. But many patients, it's a nightmare for the patient and the surgeon uh, when, when things don't go right. So what I'd like to do is talk to you a little bit about transplantation and really stretch your minds to see where we're going in the future with organ replacement. I'm not gonna talk about artificial organs, but I'm gonna talk about engineering super organs. The, 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 the take home messages are two of them. One is focus on regenerating the organs, allowing them to recover and transplanting a known product. And the second one, and the most important concept that I'd like to challenge everyone in the audience where we really need to work on fixing and, and bringing transplantation into the era of personalized medicine for the organ. And I'll explain that to you. So if you think about an organ for transplantation, we take the organ, whether it's a heart, lung, kidney, liver, pancreas, out of one body, transport it across the country, and put it into another person's body, into another more hostile environment where that body is going to work to reject that organ as, as a foreign object for its entire life. And you wonder that we're ever successful in that endeavor. The cornerstone of success of transplantation was achieved when we figured out that when you're going to take an organ out of the body, the best way to do it is to try and slow down the process of death. Slow the organ down so that you can just race the clock and get it back to where it gets its oxygen and its nutrient supply again. So what we did was we figured out ways to cool the organ and we'd flush cool the organ and, and, and shut it down. The problem with flush cooling the organ is you do shut it down. So not only do you shut down the dying process, you also shut down the recovery process. You shut down any ability to heal you shut down any ability for you to facilitate healing or to treat the organ or to assess it. So once you shut down, you're stuck with what, you've, what your end assessment was, and then you go do the transplant. And the second problem with our paradigm is you only find out how it's going to work after you finish the transplant. And if it's a lung, your patient will die if the transplant that lung doesn't work. So that is the main problem. So now what, what I'm going to show you, if we can wheel the ex vivo system out, we've really taken the system totally and turned it around. We set out to say, can we genetically modify organs so that they're better prepared to, cre to deal with the stress of a transplant process? 
to, to, to deal with the fact that they're going to lose their nutrient supply, that they're going to be uh, out of the body for a period of time and exposed to different stresses in, 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 in the recipient. We also wanted to say, can we teach that organ? Can we modify it so it looks more like self? So when you put it in to a new recipient, that recipient doesn't reject it. The problem with our paradigm was the fact that we, we would have the organ in the donor and we have very little time to assess it and very little time to work on it and fix it. So when we developed ways to genetically modify the organs, we were able to, to do this, but only in a few organs. We then set out to develop a system that you see here, where we could keep the organ outside the body at normal temperature so that we can actually assess its function. We can work on it and treat it with, with drugs, with medications, and with sophisticated therapies like gene therapy, like cell therapy. And what you're looking at here is a pig lung that we retrieved this morning in, 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 in a similar technique that we retrieve lungs for human transplantation today. The lungs are put on a circuit where they're breathing with a ventilator. The breathing tube here goes into the, into the airway of the lung. And it's breathing just like a patient on a ventilator. Here you have a system which is really a mini heart-lung machine but it's running backwards. So what the heart-lung machine is doing, the artificial lung membrane is here, it removes the oxygen from the blood and adds carbon dioxide so that the lung can work and, and add oxygen, remove carbon dioxide, and we can measure that function. We can measure the compliance of the lung, we can measure the, blood, the, the, the resistance to flow in, in, the, in the lung blood vessels. You'll notice that we're doing it without blood at all. It's an acellular solution being pumped through, through the lungs. And this provides nutrients, but also uh, avoids damage to the lung. So you have a stable system in the lung. Now I'm going to invite a couple of people up in a few minutes to, uh, to uh, come and touch a live lung. Uh, so you can feel it because it is a unique experience. I get to do it all the time and I think it's very cool, but I think you will too. Uh, so if, uh, if I could have a couple people show of hands, you can come up, Martha, for, you, for sure, you can come up. I'll take one of you over there and one person over there. Oh, Charity's gonna come up too, but we'll do that. So, yeah, you can't do it, that's too much fun. So what we, d we did is we d we've designed a system here where you can, you can work on the lung. We can bronchoscope the lung and look inside. Yeah, we're coming up. Paul, do you have the gloves there? You, you, you can bronchoscope the lung, and that's how we deliver our gene therapy in the lung. And, and we have the, the whole system. I'll take a pair of gloves, too, there, Paul. Thanks. Here. Has everybody got some? Okay, who's going to go first, Richard? No, let Charity, Charity go first. Okay, Charity. So it, it feels, right. So now just feel it like that, and you can squeeze it just gently. It's very soft. Yes, it's very soft. It, feel, it feels like a sponge, doesn't it? Yeah, now feel okay. it when a breath goes in it. You just we'll feel when a breath goes in. We'll, we'll get some, we'll get some gloves. Oh, wow. Get some more gloves. Okay. So that's just like you taking a breath. Martha, do you want to have a feel of that? So solid. It's totally soft. Yeah. So the lung is, is the most fragile of the organs and therefore was, was really the last of the, of the major organs to be able to be transplanted. And this lung is alive. So while it's sitting here, it's not dying anymore. We're facilitating recovery. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> it's interesting. It is. Oh, you got a good gosh. shot of it. <laughs> it is. It's amazing. It is amazing. I, I will tweet this because. Oh, uh, yes. No, it's fascinating. Yes, we're on it Twitter. So are, are our lungs that color? I thought our lungs were redder. Yeah, so our lungs are slightly pinker, and if you live, uh, if you smoke or you live in a polluted city, then there'll be little black soot spots on it. But this is sort of what a healthy young person's lung would look like. The si this is about two-thirds the size of, of a human lung. Uh, so this was from about a 35-kilogram pig, but uh, an average person's lung would be about this size. Please, go ahead. 
So what should I do? Just have a feel. You can squeeze it, and it's soft. And, and I'd hold it till the breath comes through it, and you'll get the idea of, of, of how the lung breathes. And so th this is going into the artery, the pulmonary artery that goes from the heart to the, to the lung, and this is the vein drainage coming out. Then, can you tell people what it feels like? Which is stronger? Spongy. Tissues? Yeah. So the lung is made of thousands of little air sacs and thousands of very fragile blood vessels where the air is on one side and the blood is on the other side and the oxygen and carbon dioxide are able to be transferred over. So when you take a lung and put it through a transplant or a process like this, those very, very fine membranes are very vulnerable and, and get damaged. So part of the achievement here and really the big breakthrough was the fact that we can keep a lung at normal body temperature for a day now and not have the system injure the lung. So this has really opened up the whole realm of, of, of personalized medicine, of opportunities to fix whatever's wrong with the lung. So now what we do, where we're going with this is say, what is wrong with that donor lung? Find out the problem, treat it specifically with targeted therapies, um, and, and then reassess it, make sure that it's okay, and transplant a known product. Now, this looks like science fiction to you, but it's not. We're doing this today. We have transplanted 30 patients using this technique, using lungs that we wouldn't have used, and now 30 people are alive because they got their lung transplant in the last year in trial. So. It's something that I certainly never thought I'd see in my career time, and, and I think it, it is so exciting to see what opportunities now have opened up with this uh, new technology. Did everybody get a chance? Did you? I did. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I got it. You did? You yeah. did? Yeah. Yeah. Mark? Thank you, Martha, for thinking of me. Was from you. Thank Great. You. Thanks, <laughs> guys. <laughs> yes, that's from this morning. Are there any other questions? I or? have one, one question. Yes. This works, you said this is the, the most fragile of all mm -hmm. organs. Does it work, what are the other organs, similar parallel ways of keeping, a, uh, you know, you, you have the problem of regeneration and that. And exactly, and, and, and we're working on it with, with, with other, t we, we now have a, a, a liver version of this uh, for the liver team uh, and, and kidneys as well and so the on. The liver has to be fed with blood, doesn't it? Not necessarily, but it, it's a much, much higher um, metabolic organ, so it needs much more in terms of glucose and, and, and uh, metabolic substrate, but it, it doesn't necessarily need blood. And, and the problem with blood in these circuits is that the circuits damage the blood cells, platelets and cells, and then they in turn damage the organ and it becomes a vicious cycle. So it was really the, developing the balance where you could create a homeostatic situation with the organ and the system keep a stable state over time. Not to stress the organ, but to maintain it. Then we can look at fixing it and building and creating super organs, organs that are better than the ones that you found. And the holy grail really will be tolerance if we can make this lung look like self. Mm -hmm. I just want to say, touching it, people said it was squishy, and it was the softest, one of the softest things I've ever touched. Don't you agree, Paul? It was one of the softest things I've ever touched in my life. It's a different, I can't compare it to something else. It's no. a strange It's, it's feeling. softer than a sponge. Yeah. Uh, it, we will, uh, after the end of this session and before dinner, if a few of you want to come by, we will have it running. <laughs> and I, I didn't want to leave everybody, everybody out, but it, it, it is a very and cool dinner is going to be tripe only. <laughs> Lights, it's gone. <laughs> Great. So, yeah. Great. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks Thank you very much. much.